You might wonder, why is the new 1800 horsepower V16 Bugatti called the Tourbillon? And the answer is very simple. Rich dudes love watches. You can spend house money, as in the amount of money needed to buy a house, on a little device that sits on your wrist and tells you what time it is. And while I try not to yuck anyone's yum, it's something I've simply never understood. But saying that hits me with an immediate realization of hypocrisy, because if a watch is simply a device to tell what time it is, well then a car is simply a device to transport you from one location to another. Nobody needs a thousand horsepower naturally aspirated V16 engine, but the mere thought of it fills me with joy, delighting the inner child inside me. So if a car can transcend its mechanical form to become an icon of timeless elegance and engineering, so too can a watch. No, 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 I'm sorry, I can't, I can't. This tells me what time it is, that's all I need. Watches, they're just, they're just, I'm sorry, it's dumb. So while the tourbillon is named after a complex mechanism within pointlessly expensive watches, well, show me a watch that can make this sound. I rest my case. So to better understand this Bugatti, I want to discuss four main subjects. First of all, we have all the specifications now, let's go over it. Second, why did they choose to go naturally aspirated? Third, why did they choose a V16 engine? And finally, how fast can it actually go if it didn't have that limiter at 445 kilometers per hour? And that final question leads us to a very interesting problem this car suffers from, which we'll get into. All right, so let's start off with an overview of the powertrain. In the front, we have two electric motors. You have true torque vectoring up front. Just behind that and sandwiched between the seats, you've got your battery pack. This is about a 25 kilowatt hour battery. Behind that, you have the naturally aspirated V16, 8.3 liters developed by Cosworth. Super cool, Cosworth is just, you know, the name of the game these days. Really cool to see another one of their high revving applications in a hypercar, and we've got that matched up with an eight-speed dual clutch transmission and finally on the back of that another yes the third electric motor so three electric motors plus an 8.3 liter naturally aspirated v16 engine so the v16 engine producing a thousand horsepower 900 newton meters of torque and revving to either 9,000 RPM or 9,500 RPM. So everything I have written in red, the spec sheet says one thing, Mate Rimac has said another thing, I don't know which is correct, so I've reached out for clarification, I'll share it if I get it, but regardless, it may rev to 9,500 RPM, it looks like it based on the tack that they share, and then also these electric motors can produce about 400 horsepower each and 240 Newton meters of torque, yet the total system torque is 2,300 Newton meters, so if you take 900 Newton meters and you take 240 times three, you get what, 1,620 Newton meters, which is not 2,300 Newton meters. So I don't know, I don't know what the numbers are, right? They share different numbers, but the thing that we do know is 1,800 horsepower. This is the big important number, 1,800 horsepower powertrain, a thousand of which is coming from the combustion engine and 800 of which is coming from the electric motors because they are limited by the battery pack. The battery pack can only supply a maximum of about 600 kilowatts or 800 horsepower so you have that power to play around with between these three motors each capable of about 400 horsepower now what's really exciting are the different drive modes so it had been previously reported that it was going to have three motors plus the combustion engine but what we didn't know is that that third motor was sitting on the back of this eight-speed dual clutch transmission so this enables something pretty cool they can run it in hybrid mode where of course you're just running all three electric motors plus the combustion engine 1800 horsepower all wheel drive or you can shut off the electric system entirely and just run the v16 so a thousand horsepower rear wheel drive this thing is two completely different animals in the same car so that's very cool as you've got that electric motor on the back and you can basically just disconnect it not worry about it and have the engine running everything super cool plus it has an ev only mode for perhaps cities which may ban combustion engines driving through them you've got this ev only mode for about 60 kilometers of driving range super cool with 800 horsepower, so still decently quick, you know, and uh, all-wheel drive, of course. And then finally, it has a charge mode, so you can use that engine to spin up this electric motor and put some energy back into the battery pack. Okay, so electric motors, big battery, big engine, surely this thing is going to weigh more than the Chiron, right? 
Wrong. Incredibly, this is going to weigh less than 2,000 kilograms and it's going to weigh less than the Chiron despite having a larger engine, three electric motors, and a battery pack added. So hats off to the Bugatti team for keeping the weight of this thing, you know, relatively low considering how much power it has and how much is going inside of this car. Now, to answer the question, why go naturally aspirated? Well, the thing is, from a driver's standpoint, naturally aspirated has always been the answer because of the sound and because of the response, but they're power limited. But now that we have the electric motors to help out, going naturally aspirated makes a lot of sense for a car of this caliber. But why a V16? Well, Bugatti actually did look into using a naturally aspirated W16 engine in order to continue to use that unique powertrain. But with a W16 engine, it doesn't work great with naturally aspirated as the induction style. Reason being, you're using VR blocks. And so you have your cylinders offset, which means your intake runners are in varying lengths as well as your exhaust runners. And for a naturally aspirated engine, in order to get all of your pulse is to line up and work out for ideal pressure within your cylinders, you don't want to have these uneven runners. So as a result, okay, we need to go to something different, like a V16, which is super special. With the Bugatti Chiron, using this was no problem because you've got turbochargers. So it's kind of a dumb method of forcing in air where you just have high pressure and the air is forced to go in, doesn't really care how long that intake runner is. Now at the back of the vehicle, you'll notice a clever perk of the result of using this V16 engine, and that is we have this massive diffuser. Now the challenge with diffusers is that you don't want a really steep angle. They become less effective. So you want an angle of about 11 degrees, but what that means is you need the diffuser to extend really far up the car. And so if you have this, you know, 4.7 about meter length car, well that diffuser needs to be as long as possible. And so it's actually about two meters on the tourbillon, which is quite long and it puts it about halfway through the car. Now, if you were to have a wide engine, well then you're suddenly in the path of this diffuser. So by using that narrower engine, they're able to have that really long diffuser and also have it go around the engine. And they even have the engine at a bit of an angle to take advantage of the space underneath it. So keep in mind, this new engine has about a meter long crankshaft. That for scale is about the center of my nose to the edge of my finger, just slightly longer to that. I mean, it is a massive crankshaft, absolutely enormous. And so the good news with using a big diffuser is that you can get a good amount of downforce without a high drag penalty. So that's good for top speed, which yeah, it's kind of Bugatti's thing. So speaking of top speed, the tourbillon is limited, meaning it's capable of faster to 445 kilometers per hour. But what happens if we take that limiter off? I mean, why would the speedometer go to 550 kilometers per hour if it isn't capable of crossing 500 kilometers per hour? Something we've never seen a production car do. Now, when effectively asked by Top Gear about going after speed records, Bugatti CEO Matej Rimac simply said, well, Bugatti is about pushing the limits. Let's see. Now, admittedly, Bugatti hasn't released all the specs on this car, so we're going to have to make some assumptions. But there's a lot of available information about the Chiron, so we're able to make relatively accurate guesses. So the question is, can the tourbillon exceed 500 kilometers per hour? And we can figure out how much power is needed to do that by looking at all of the resistive forces acting against it at 500 kilometers per hour. Now, we do have to make some assumptions, but sometimes you can learn things from manufacturers by what they don't tell you. For example, they told us that it has a lower frontal area than the Bugatti Chiron. They told us that it's lighter than the Bugatti Chiron. They told us it has more power than the Bugatti Chiron. They said that it has a lower height than the Bugatti Chiron, but they did not tell us that it has a lower drag coefficient. So I suspect the drag coefficient is about the same or slightly worse. And part of the reason for that is the open air, the exposed engine that you have in the back, which is increasing its drag coefficient. But it looks beautiful. So using as accurate of assumptions as I can come up with, we get a guesstimate of the total power output required for the tourbillon to hit 500 kilometers per hour of about 1815 horsepower. So super close to the actual number within the error range of these assumptions, absolutely. So yeah, it has the power to do it. Simple as that, it can do it, right? Unfortunately, there's a pretty big problem here. 
People are used to discussing top speed as it relates to combustion cars, but with EVs, it's a different story. All right, so there's a bit of logic we need to work through. So the first thing we need to understand is the power required to overcome aerodynamic drag is a function of velocity cubed. So what the heck does this mean? Well, here we have a plot looking at horsepower versus speed, how much power is required to go a certain speed of the Bugatti Chiron 300 plus. So the fastest version of the Bugatti Chiron. So you can see at 100 kilometers per hour, you only need about 20 horsepower versus at 200 kilometers per hour, you need 120 horsepower. So this function increases dramatically. Again, it's a function of velocity cubed. So the faster you get, there's a dramatic increase in how much power is required. So with 1600 horsepower, the Bugatti Chiron is hitting its top speed of about 490 kilometers per hour. Okay, just shy of 500 kilometers per hour. But because of this equation, it's a very powerful step to just go those additional 10 kilometers per hour. It could take as much as 100 horsepower in order to make it work out. And why do I bring all of this up? Well, you see this steep curve here. The problem with this is, as you get to these higher and higher speeds, the time required in order to go that little bit step up is significant. So the Bugatti Chiron Super Sport 300 Plus was at full throttle for 70 seconds before reaching its top speed. That is a lot of time. Okay, so the Turbion has 1,800 horsepower, but the question is for how long? Because this 1,800 is comprised of 1,000 horsepower from the combustion engine versus 800 horsepower from the electric powertrain. So how long does this 800 horsepower last? Now, why do I ask this question? Well, a combustion engine will deliver its full power until it runs out of fuel. They're very happy to do that as long as you keep them at the right temperature. Battery limitations, however, exist. So the size of a battery, determines how much power can it put out. The larger the battery, the better. And then also, there is a limited duration on how much time a battery can supply its maximum output. Now, there's a lot of reasons for this, but the point is, the longer you floor it in an EV, without letting off that accelerator pedal, eventually that power starts to drop. Now, this is especially true if you're really pushing the limits of that battery with a really high discharge rate. So here I'm going to show you some of the discharge rates of different vehicles out there today. We're looking at kilowatts delivered by the powertrain divided by the amount of kilowatt hours that that battery pack has, the discharge rate. So for a Tesla Model 3 performance, you're delivering about 4.6 times as many kilowatts as you have kilowatt hours in that battery pack. Lucid Air Sapphire, 7.6. Rimac Nevera, 11.3. Bugatti Turbion, 24.2. This is a very high number. If you plot it against the other vehicles out there, it's this weird, super high outlier. Crazy to look at. Though I did think, well, what about the new 911 GTS? Though it has a much smaller battery pack, but also has a very high number, 25.3, though only limited to that power output for 10 seconds. So again, at some point as you're flooring it, that power is going to start to drop. And again, top speed runs take a lot of time. So I started to try and think, what can Bugatti do in order to get the maximum top speed possible? And we have a thousand horsepower combustion engine that we can start off with. We don't have to use the electric motors to first start accelerating, right? So we can get as fast as the combustion engine can take us first to save that battery for that last little stint. Okay, well how fast can we get with a thousand horsepower? For the Bugatti Turbion, again making those same assumptions we made previously, if you do the math, you get a number of about 400 kilometers per hour or about 250 miles per hour that you can get to just using the combustion engine alone. So we're pretty close, right? We only have 100 kilometers per hour to go to hit that 500 kilometers per hour mark. But again, that's the part that takes the most time because we're using, we're up against all that aerodynamic drag. So if you look at the SS300 Plus, what Bugatti did with the Chiron, it took them 45 seconds about to go from 400 kilometers per hour to 490 kilometers per hour. So what's the problem here? Well, there's several problems. First of all, if you're just using the combustion engine to accelerate up to 250 miles per hour, it's gonna take longer, meaning you're eating up more 
more distance. So you need an even longer stretch of road to make this happen. Second, if you're taking 600 kilowatts from that battery, this is a 25 kilowatt hour battery, well that means you're eating 40% of the battery's charge every minute. So you don't have a ton of time, but plenty of time to make a top speed run. But does that mean if you get to those lower percentages of battery state of charge, do you have less power to offer? And finally, you have those power limitations as far as duration. So if you're flooring it for you know 45 seconds, that power is gonna start to come down, which means you're not gonna have 1800 horsepower, which is about what we need in order to hit 500 kilometers per hour. Okay, but we don't know how or if this battery will be limited with continuous output. So what's an example we can look at? Well, how about the Rimac Nevera, which is an EV that has basically smashed all of the records for performance cars. So the Rimac Nevera has about 1400 kilowatts of power, about 1900 horsepower. It has a better drag coefficient than the Bugatti Chiron, and they have similar dimensions, so about the same frontal area, which means if it has more power, it should be able to easily exceed 500 kilometers per hour, right? but it doesn't. Its top speed was measured at 412 kilometers per hour by Rimac. Now, why is that number so much lower if the Rimac has so much more power than the Chiron? Well, you can look at the strategy that they use. So they kept it at about 20% throttle until they reached 250 kilometers per hour. Impressive that it can do that with 20% throttle. And then they used 100% throttle for about 30 seconds. And what you saw is the peak power output went from about 1330 kilowatts by the end of that 30 seconds was all the way down to 960 kilowatts. In other words, it was at 68% of its rated power after 30 seconds of full throttle. Okay, so if we take that 68% number, multiply it by our 800 horsepower and say, after 30 seconds of full throttle acceleration, we have 68% of 800. That puts us at 1544 horsepower, which probably isn't enough to hit 500 kilometers per hour. So they have a very real challenge here with this battery in order to hit a top speed of 500 kilometers per hour. So I'll close this out by making a statement I hope to later regret. I don't think it's gonna break 500 kilometers per hour. I don't think it can do it without more power or better aerodynamics. And if there's one thing dudes love more than watches, it's being right. So I hope to one day see Bugatti challenge the 500 kilometer per hour barrier. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them below. Thanks for watching.